like a really like ambitious goal of interpretability where like the whole architecture of the like the forward pass can be understood to a human or at least, yeah, like these high level uh, concepts, like the whole uh, routing to a particular expert has some like meaning to humans. And I think it's possible that we can get to this stage with mechanistic interpretability. But I think it's worth noting that even if this like fails pretty badly, it's still possible for the interpretability of narrow tasks, like an understanding of the dangerous capabilities, so we can at least remove those dangerous capabilities, even if we don't have an understanding of all capabilities of the model. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, I'm excited to take a deep dive into mechanistic interpretability with Arthur Kahnme. Looking back on the show over the last few months, I realized that I'd mentioned the topic of mechanistic interpretability many times, repeatedly highlighted it as one of the most promising paths to long-term safety, and shared a few of the canonical results that most inform my AI worldview. But we've never really got into much detail about how mechanistic interpretability work is actually performed. Today, we're getting into those details. Now, this is an advanced topic, so while we definitely take our time to explain the key concepts in the simplest possible terms, we do assume throughout that you understand the differences between related concepts like parameters and activations, or attention heads and MLP blocks. If those distinctions aren't already clear, I might suggest watching part one of my AI scouting report first, as the fundamentals that I present there really are meant as a foundation for a conversation like this one. Beyond that foundation, Arthur really is the perfect person to guide us, as he's just published a new paper and software library that aim to accelerate mechanistic interpretability work by automating the most cumbersome and tedious parts of the typical research workflow. Beginning with the core questions that mechanistic interpretability seeks to answer, and describing the conceptual basis and experimental setups that are most commonly used, Arthur does a great job, both in the paper and in this conversation, of providing clear, even intuitive explanations for how researchers are starting to pry open the black box that are large language models. It's really fascinating to learn how subcircuits are discovered within transformers, and to see the effective but often quite alien problem-solving strategies that models learn. I'm also really excited by Arthur's vision for how mechanistic interpretability work could one day allow us to inspect powerful AI systems for the emergence of concerning capabilities, even during the training process. While we're a super long way from being able to do that reliably today, such mastery of how AI systems work would be an outstanding development for safety, reliability, and performance. This is an unusually accessible introduction to mechanistic interpretability from a practitioner who is among the best in the field. I learned a ton, and I think you will too. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Arthur Conmey. Arthur Conmey, welcome to The Cognitive Revolution. Thanks, Nathan. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. So, boy, you know, folks have, uh, who've listened to this show for a little bit have heard me certainly mention the concept of mechanistic interpretability a few times. And I have, you know, mentioned that I'm, excited about it as a research direction. And it seems like one of the kind of most promising paths to long term safety with AI systems is to understand them, you know, in a deeper way in a, in a more penetrating way than we do right now. But we've not really got into the details too much other than looking at a few kind of headline results of grokking and, you know, a few kind of seminal things that that give people a sense that progress is happening here. Uh, this, for many, I think, will still be their first kind of real deep dive into mechanistic interpretability. So I'm excited to um, to get into all that with you. Maybe for starters, can you just tell us how you think about mechanistic interpretability? Like, what is it? You know, what are the goals? Uh, what attracts you to it, perhaps, as well? So mechanistic interpretability is the reverse engineering of the learned algorithms that uh, neural networks implement. Uh, into human understandable concepts. So the idea here is that neural networks, uh, like machine learning models, are an algorithm which turns inputs into outputs. 
but it's very opaque how exactly that like model is turning inputs into outputs. And in mechanistic interpretability, we aim to explain how that happens in terms of the internal components of that model in a human understandable way. So not merely that like this matrix is multiplied by this matrix and produces the outputs, but like, no, here are the like high level variables the model's using internally to produce outputs from inputs. And so I see like my sort of research goal as is to like improve the like world understanding of how neural networks operates by, for example, uh, explaining more of the like uh, behaviors of like neural network models in terms of their like internal components. And uh, I think uh, my background, which got me into like mechanistic interpretability was like probably studying like mathematics in my like undergraduate degree, where uh, almost the whole subject is about like actually understanding how things happen. And uh, like I was drawn to like this area in machine learning because machine learning is in general not a field where the understanding of how like algorithms are operating is the like way that further techniques are made. It's just like a blind optimization procedure, but it doesn't have to be that way. And like my my like motivation is to like continue to like uh, make the like, machine learning and the, like, the algorithms learned by neural networks more understandable in terms of like human concepts. So there's a few kind of levels to this, I suppose, in terms of how much we could achieve, right? And I think we'll, different results kind of get to, to different stages of this kind of depth of understanding, let's say. The way I kind of think about it, and tell me if you would present this a little differently, is first, you might just ask, how is it that the models are doing what they do? Like, can we even just describe you know, how information is being processed in any way that's more enlightening than just, you know, everything kind of connects to everything and we don't really know. If I then went up a level, I could say, okay, well, I could just, you know, describe that and we're going to get into, into the work that you've done to help kind of zero in on the part of the network that seems to be most important for a given task. But then I could go beyond that and I could say, well, okay, I can see that like these are the parts that are lighting up, but why does that work? You know, like what is it actually doing is there a way for me to understand that in any sort of intuitive way and then i guess maybe a third level would be like to what degree can we understand or, or determine if the things that it has learned the strategies that it has learned are in fact general and constitute some like meaningful understanding or are they sort of you know still in the stochastic parrot paradigm of yeah you may get decent results uh, you know, on things that look like the training data, but there's not really a deeper understanding here. And I guess, you know, further too, you might say, well, is there anything we can do to encourage, you know, actual understanding or maybe discourage, I guess, depending on exactly, you know, what you're looking for from your systems. How do you think about those layers? You know, would you adjust that um, that mental organization of this? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I agree with like the first two layers, Nathan, you proposed there. And like, think about those two a lot. That to me, mechanistic interpretability like has like just like two steps essentially that firstly you find what the like important subcomponents of this huge neural network are that sort of like matter and then having established this like subset that is important you can then ask well what is like the meaning of that subset which i think like yeah maps onto like your sort of two levels very well and i think describes like a bunch of research that like uh, has already been done i'm sure we'll get into that further and yeah, I think that then like the third level is like one of many like sort of uh, uh, potential use cases essentially of mechanistic interpretability, where this could enable us to like uh, answer the questions of like, are these models like doing reasoning or like uh, modeling humans that they're like interacting with? Or is it just like a wad of heuristics and like statistics that is not doing anything intelligent beneath just a, like a ton of like rote based rules? And like, we don't know the answer to that question at this point in time. Uh, yeah, the sort of stochastic parrots hypothesis is still a hypothesis that models are just like parroting nonsense, uh, but it like looks correct to us because we haven't probed deep enough and no one does probe deep enough with their evaluations. And if we can like actually understand the algorithms these models are implementing, we could have a yes or no answer to the question of whether there are just like in general surface level heuristics or like there are actual like algorithms which go beyond just like normal heuristics. In my general sense, correct me if you would disagree with this, but my general sense is that it's kind of always 
both. And we just don't really know which is the case for any given task and model that we might want to consider, right? Like the, it seems to me that maybe not always both, but certainly you get to a certain level of scale. There seems to be some generality that starts to appear, which, you know, even if we haven't proven it yet, we've seen enough examples of like, you know, meaningful grokking to believe that more is happening. But we just don't know for any particular task under consideration, you know, at the start, like, has this been understood? Or is it is it still, you know, just statistical correlation that kind of appears to be making sense? Is that your understanding too? Yeah, I think that it's pretty clear that there are cases when like models are like reasoning or performing like the correct algorithm to like produce certain completions to problems. Like uh, you can think of basic math problems or basic reasoning problems uh, that have been like uh, turned into benchmarks and then like destroyed by various like large language models as like affirmative tests. There are some cases of reasoning going on. But at the like the frontier of capabilities, where like uh, you suddenly have like the next like size of model that can do something that like previous models couldn't do, such as GPT four surprising many people with its like coding abilities, it's unclear whether this is uh, at that scale when like the ability first emerges, like actually just pattern matching that's worked in enough cases to like convince humans. Or there's something deeper going on where at some level you reach some like understanding of code. And I think this like is uh, quite an important distinction, whether like frontier capabilities are incredibly surface level when they first emerge, or whether they can be like learnt in generality straight away. Because like the emergence of capabilities and the unpredictability of new things that models can do is quite important for like the future risks of systems. Because if we can't like predict what's going to come, then we would at least like to know that there's hopefully like a surface level heuristic maybe than like a completely general solution to something that we thought was very difficult because this could cause quite a lot of instability and uh, unpredictability when we like deploy systems. So like quite a, we're already getting quite into like the <laughs> high level motivation for why like these uh, issues are quite serious. But uh, yes, I agree that there's a both uh, surface level heuristics and general like general um reasoning ability in these models and uh i think that the problem is like distinguishing the two particularly at the frontier if that makes sense totally i've said you know probably on a few episodes at this point that for me the most important sentence in the gpt4 technical report is the it's a quite a short one certain capabilities remain hard to predict and there they show the reversal of what had been an inverse scaling law where I'm sure you're you know, familiar with this bigger models had been more susceptible to hindsight neglect or hindsight uh, bias sort of, you know, reasoning fallacies until GP4 when suddenly sure looks like, you know, that has been grokked. I don't think it's uh, been certainly hasn't been proven in public. I don't know what they know internally, but you know, to go from everything's getting worse as the models get bigger to all of a sudden, you know, GPT-4 is perfect, definitely, you know, suggests that there are some kind of phase changes that happen on the frontier. And the fact that, you know, even OpenAI, for all the smooth curves that they can plot, you know, can't really predict on any given task, whether it's going to be understood or not, you know, that, that definitely uh, creates a lot of unpredictability, as you said. So let's get back a little later to what we might do to encourage things to be more, you know, understandable from the start. And for now, just dive into what you have done to help us make sense of the models that we do have at present. So I love the way that you approach this paper. And the, I also enjoy the uh, clever name, the ACDC, uh, which you give to the, the algorithm. I, I think first, it's really useful just to describe the general process that one takes to mechanistic interpretability. I think you did a beautiful job of that in the paper. And this will be the first time that folks have heard, you know, this level of detail. So for starters, how about just kind of giving us this overview of the workflow that mechanistic interpretability researchers tend to pursue? Um, we'll get into each, you know, uh, of the three parts in more detail. And then of course, you know, get into especially the part that you've automated. Cool. Yeah, that sounds great, Nathan. Hey, We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey, everybody. If you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll want to know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your businesses. 
Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offer today. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with our promo code at netsuite.com slash cognitive. netsuite.com slash cognitive to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm. That is netsuite.com slash cognitive. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. So uh, the way we like set up the like three steps of the mechanistic interpretability workflow, just to prepare in advance, are firstly like choosing a like behavior or a task that like a, a a neural network can perform, such as as we discussed like uh, the ability to like predict uh, like modular addition in like a uh, like a language model trained to uh, get the correct answer to modular addition sounds, uh, and then secondly after picking this like behavior, we then define like the scope of the interpretation that we're aiming to explain. So this means that uh, sometimes it's possible to explain the whole like computation that the model performs in terms of individual neurons, for example, which uh, communicate between different layers of your model. But this is in general pretty difficult since there are a huge number of neurons and uh, like computation is not often localized to individual neurons. So like other researchers and projects I worked on have instead like looked at the like attention heads and MLPs of transformers. So uh, an MLP consists of many neurons, uh, but you can consider it as just like one component. And so uh, a researcher who might maybe thinks it's a bit too ambitious to explain how a task is performed in terms of uh, the like individual neurons may wish to explain in t like the task in terms of the MLPs, the whole MLPs that are important in the model. Maybe it's just a certain subset of them. So then that's the first two steps. And then the third step is to perform uh, a bunch of like intervention experiments that uh, find those exact like uh, tension heads or MLPs or neurons that are important for that task at hand. And this is generally the most like laborious from the human side, uh, like part of the process. And hence why like we thought it was a good fit for trying to like automate in terms of the like circuit discovery process. So yeah, those are like the three steps is like a, a high level overview. Uh, I'm happy to get into them if you'd like, Nathan, or if there are any other questions uh, that are, seem to stick out to you, I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, I definitely want to get into each one in more detail. So, but just to kind of echo it back to you, first is identifying a behavior of interest. I mean, let me, let's just get into the details now. So the, I'm struck by, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs here, right? You've got, uh, first of all, what models do you have access to? You know, what models can you kind of actually manage to scale your approach up to handling? You know, what are those models capable of? So those are kind of some very practical constraints. In general, people seem to be doing this work at this stage on relatively small models. And those, those models are, you know, only capable of relatively modest tasks, certainly compared to, you know, the likes of GPT-4 and Claude 2. So maybe just, you know, give us a little bit more insight into how you choose what models you're working with and how you identify, you know, behaviors that you think are actually, you know, particularly worth this depth of investigation. Yeah, sure. So that's a good question about like the, like the first step of like, w w what do you mean by like picking a task or like the criteria to like choose here? And I think that um, some of the criteria which feel important to me are like localization of a task, such as uh, something which can be like uh, like thought about on its own as like distinct from the rest of the sort of natural language computation. So one of the tasks we considered was a task where a model is able to predict like 
a future year in a given century from uh, like a previous year in that century. And in this case, this is like quite localized to uh, individual token completions that are about particular years that have been like incremented from the uh, like previous year. Whereas like tasks that are somewhat more vaguely defined, such as like the model produced like a non toxic response or a non-harmful response are often really like open-ended and difficult to pin down. And so it's generally harder to like interpret tasks that have quite a vague uh, like a definition and can be like completed with a huge number of different tokens, for example, because this is just going to be distributed all through the network and be quite difficult to pin down. So that's like one consideration on like task choice. That's mostly a question of tractability. Like how tractable is it to actually be able to like complete this interpretability project? And you could often like narrow down wide concepts into smaller ones to like get around that issue. And then the like oh the, the second consideration would be something like uh is this like task relevant to something that like uh bigger models can do? and like is confusing from like the, the relevance of like the actual capabilities of these models so as examples of this a lot of people are interested in models ability to recall facts for example like uh, to produce completions to sentences that require knowing something about like the objects in that sentence and this is important because we'd like to know like if we train our language models on this much data and this kind of person is mentioned this many times, for example, well, will the model be able to like store that information? Will it know that information and stuff like that? And so this turns out to be like quite like an interesting problem because it certainly matters for like models we deploy like later. And uh, like there are lots of things that natural language models do because just the training data distribution is extremely diverse. And so selecting something which is useful as like models get bigger uh, is another important consideration. So yeah, those are the two considerations for like choosing a task. That's really interesting. So just on the first point about kind of locality, it strikes me that there's probably at least a rough mapping onto or maybe from tasks that we ourselves sort of have some ability to describe how we're doing and tasks that we might hope would be tractable. You know, for example, a toxic or non-toxic response. Like if I look at my own behavior, I'm like, not always that super clear as to why I generated a toxic or non-toxic response. Whereas, you know, I think I have a, a clearer sense of, you know, how I'm thinking about something like, you know, for this example, you gave about the years, you know, a prompt, sample prompt from the paper. The war lasted from 1517 to 15, and then it's up to the language model to complete that. Introspectively, it feels like I have a better sense, you know, for what I'm doing. How much does that kind of introspective, you know, decomposition of tasks feed into your task selection? Not to say it should or shouldn't, but I'm curious. I think that we always would be choosing tasks that involve something that like humans know how to do because then we can like put metrics and measures of how much the model does them since we can like figure out how we do them but i think the like interesting point here is that models often do things in very different ways to humans and we like found uh, like several examples of this in the circuits we discovered where when models are like uh choosing the correct name to put on a uh, the end of a sentence they often like aggregate all the names together and then remove the deleted names which is not how like humans reason about names at all so i think it's the case that we always choose tasks that like as humans we can like understand like understand how we perform them at least at this point in time uh, but we don't always observe that the language models they can perform these tasks in the same way as humans at all. Yeah, certainly it's always important to keep in mind the, you know, just profound, profound differences between the way that we do things and the way that the models are often seemingly, in fact, learning to do them. So, okay, well, there'll be more opportunity, I think, to unpack some of these examples and kind of, you know, see how this plays out. When you're putting together a data set, I also understand that it's important to have contrasting examples where 
you want to set up a situation where you can kind of look at the difference between a sample that's like doing or an example you know, completion that's doing what you want it to do and one that's not doing it. Can you give us a little bit more intuition for that? Is it like for the year example, would the contrasting be like doing it right and doing it wrong? Like getting the wrong answer, you know, from 15, 17 to 15, 15, something nonsensical. Is that the kind of like super sharp contrast? Or is it just like other tasks, you know, that are kind of not this task? Cool. Yeah, that's a great question. So when we define these tasks, as we can like sort of explore in our paper, a crucial component of this is the selection of like two data sets. And yeah, the first one is unsurprisingly a bunch of like uh, prompts or inputs to it, like a model, which have the like behavior you've identified. But you also do need like a contrasting set, as like Nathan, you've just mentioned, that are like crucial to, to find the components of the model that like actually do your like original task. And like, why do we do this? Why do we need like a comparison of two different parts? This is to do with how uh, in the language model computation, uh, it's not possible to just find the like subsets of the model, which does your one task and just completely ignore the rest of the model, because that is still going to need to do some computation in the forward pass when you're running the model to be able to produce the correct completion. Like you can't just like uh, take your model in your like programming language and just say like nope I I don't I don't want that component <laughs> like just like remove that uh, you have to be like somewhat more uh, clever and so the default path that's taken in most machine learning research uh, is pruning and what like pruning does is set certain weights in the network to zero to like remove like the effect of that uh, that like component of the model. So if it's like a neuron, it will now, now never fire if it's like weight is zero. But this is actually quite problematic because uh, the model in like training and normal like runs is not used to seeing just zeros from like a huge number of components in its like forward pass. It's used to seeing like different values which fall on some distribution. And then sometimes like something fires like slightly more than usual, let's say, and that will then cause the model to produce like the completion it does in the current setting. And so this is a quite like long uh, like point, but then the, the, the crucial uh, like finishing touch here is that if you have a contrasting set of examples, you're able to just set the like model's uh, internal activations to the activations on the like corrupted like data set. And this doesn't have the problem that a lot of machine learning research has, that it just sets to zero and the model is now like essentially confused as to what it's like doing because it's never seen zeros before. Instead, the model is just like counterfactually seeing different outputs from uh, like earlier components. So that's like the intuition for needing this like uh, contrasting set of examples. And uh, in the case of the like years, I think, where we're like predicting it for the war lasted from 1517 to 15. And uh, this uh, war uh, example is from a great paper by Michael Hanna and uh, fellow authors, where they find how GPT-2 can do greater than, if you're interested. Uh, this then has a like a baseline example that those authors chose, where I believe it says just the war lasted from 1500 to, and here, like literally any completion can work, like 1500 to 1500, 1500 to 1501, 1500 to 1599. And so the model doesn't like need to do this like greater than operation to find out the future years. And so this serves as a perfect like baseline because now when you compare your two like data sets, the model components that are important are on the like greater than 1517 to some future year data sets, but aren't important on the baseline data set, like 1500 to literally any like year in the 15, 1500s, then are like actually the model components doing that greater than computation. So I guess the key point here is that greater than is implicitly uh, an operation which is not just the super general algorithm of uh, like just a year, 
So our technique, like this like, uh, formalism of the mechanistic interpretability workflow, is able to like specifically zoom into like the task at hand, which is about predicting a greater year rather than just like any year at all. So yeah, I hope that provides like a like a bit of a longer story for why like the baseline for like mechanistic interpretability is quite important, and it's not sufficient to just have like zeros as a baseline. Yeah, cool. Okay. So, and that's in anticipation. So just to you know, kind of send some of that back to you, hopefully to make sure everybody listening along is with us. What I'm understanding is that. In anticipation of the part three, where you're going to be, you know, systematically eliminating parts of the network to figure out which parts matter most, it has been found, and you're, you have an intuition for it, but I, I assume to start it's a, as an empirical finding, as most do, that just a hard elimination of different parts of the network where we literally take them straight to zero is, in fact, kind of too far outside of what the network has learned to expect and learned to process. And so it creates these other problems. And then you actually can get better results by replacing, instead of actually deleting outright, you are replacing whatever values with something that's like representative and kind of, you know, normal in some sense for the model. But to do that, that's where you, you need these kind of baseline uh, examples to to have a sense for what that normal would be in this case. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think yeah, a key like intuition pump that like I have for why this why we'd like to avoid setting things to zeros is that possibly the models components have like an implicit bias term essentially in machine learning uh, that is not present in the literal bias parameters, but the weight matrix just on average, for example, is like outputting a value in some particular range and it's unlikely that this range will be zeros overall and so it's super useful to like use a baseline rather than use just the zeros and this was like uh, yeah it's n not my primary um research contribution but when i was at a redwood research who did like mechanistic interpretability research some of their research output provided evidence for this claim that it's not a great idea to set to like zero activations but instead like uh yeah like corrupting uh, your model with activations from a different data set example may be more representative of the, like, the model's computation. I'm as, uh, I think I mentioned always kind of very careful about analogies, but again, just for intuition's sake, if you were trying to do something like this on a human and you literally just removed part of their brain entirely, then you might imagine that like other parts of the brain would be quite disturbed by that and be like, hey, wait a second, we're expecting signal from here and we're not getting it. And the whole system can kind of, you know, go haywire. So instead of literally, I mean, that's where you get into like literal lobotomies, I suppose, instead of like actually, you know, totally disabling a part of a network, you kind of say, let me just return this to sort of baseline activity so that other parts of the network aren't like, you know, disturbed and they get something, you know, along the lines of what they're, you know, accustomed to seeing. Yeah, that sounds exactly right. And I definitely do think in terms of like similar analogies to like interventions you do on humans, like sometimes because it is helpful to like choose between different like interventions you could do on models. And I agree that like the like the zeroing intervention often is like equivalent to just like removing something in like a, like a human body or something if we were giving an analogy to like medical interventions. And in general, this like wouldn't be the way you would like treat someone. You'd rather go for like a placebo of like the like, hormone or something they're being treated for, rather than just like removing their body's ability to produce that hormone. That would be the uh, default strategy to like treating something. Okay, cool. So we're in, you know, getting close to the end of part one and definitely anticipating part three. Again, the, the part one is identify behavior of interest, a data set that demonstrates it, and a metric to evaluate it. So let's then talk about the metric to evaluate. This was one of the areas of the paper where I was a little bit confused because my intuition out of the gate was just like, if I'm trying to figure out what parts of a network are important to doing a certain thing, then the it's you know the intuitive metric to me that I would want to look at first would be like, can I 
you know, do some of this neutralization or, you know, corrupt patching, as it's called, and basically get the same output. But you take, take a few different approaches where it seems like sometimes you are just kind of trying to make sure that outputs are minimally changed, but other times you're looking at other kinds of metrics. So give us a little bit more about how you think about identifying metrics and why there are different metrics here in the first place. Sure, yeah. I think that uh, metrics are mostly like a question uh, of the like practitioner's choice in selecting a task. So to give an example, in the case of the uh, war sentences, so again, uh, the language models complete sentences like the war lasted from 1517 to 15 yada yada. Um, the language model we deem to be correct when it answers like 1518 or 1519 or some future year and like incorrect in when it like completes a sentence with lasted from 1517 to 1516. And so there is some like human judgment call here that like some completions the model chooses, like 17, 18, 19, are like the correct ones and we want to measure that. And some completions the model probably places some probability on because these models like usually output like a distribution uh, over each completion they could like create that we deem incorrect. So the like practitioners in this case decided to like measure how good the model was in this task by like summing the probabilities on the like correct completions, like the future years, and subtracting the contributions from years that were less than that. And so it like wasn't sufficient for those researchers to just find like the uh, subsets of models that were like similar to the original model, because the original model was wrong in some ways, it would sometimes predict like the wrong earlier years. And so the like metric allows you to just be a little bit more like fine grained and uh, measure an exact like uh, behavior that the model has rather than just uh, hoping that the model's like distribution, which includes some incorrect parts is correct. So yeah, I guess the like the high level thing here is that language models can be wrong and are often wrong, but you can like uh, select for that if you know what like the right answer is and uh, put this into a metric. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I guess we'll get into this a little bit in the upshot, you know, for kind of the findings portion as well. But it does still feel a little bit to me like, I don't know, confusing just in as much as, you know, if this model has been trained to, to do this thing. Or maybe it's not trained to do specifically this thing, but it's been trained and this is like one of the things that it seems to be able to do. If we then go in and start cutting out parts of the network or, you know, patching them with, you know, kind of neutral, uh, it doesn't seem like it would, it should get better. <laughs> um, I guess in some cases it could, but that would, you know, be kind of a weird, you know, random result or seemingly random. I mean, you can, if you have intuitions for that, I definitely want to hear them. But so then I kind of wonder, like, why not just stick to the simplest thing of, like, keeping the same original behavior uh, as opposed to kind of looking at this, you know, this kind of task specific measure that's, you know, that's kind of cooked up at, seemingly kind of ad hoc. Yeah, I think I want to push back slightly on the, like, intuition there of, like, how language models produce their completions, because... Often when we're like using like the like the GPT four and Claude two chatbots that are state of the art, it feels like they're like perfect in some completions. Like it all looks correct and there's very few errors. But the like pre-training task for models that is like most of the uh, computation procedure to produce that great model at the end involves predicting text from like across all the internet. So uh, across all books and all like forums and all like just general sites on the internet. And the model like probably always has some like uncertainty over like what exactly the like locate, like the location on the internet essentially of the prompt is that it needs to use to produce better completions that are like more likely to be correct. 
And so in some sense, it's like juggling a lot of different heuristics that some include just producing what to humans seems correct, like a year that's in future. But there's some balancing of like ironic completions or jokes or something where it has to like balance some probability that there's just like a, a dumb mistake here, essentially. And then there's also some uncertainty that maybe this like web page on the internet got like transcribed poorly so that like the document will just cut off at this point. And when you think about just like how diverse the like internet of like different uh, text pages is, it's then like less obvious that the model like should be completing what to us humans seems like the correct response. Just because there are so many contexts in which any particular sentence could arise. And this introduces just so much complexity that I guess my intuition for having like metrics for behaviors in mechanistic interpretability is you can control for this like what long tail essentially of possible reasons why completion would arise by specifically choosing like completions that are correct in the sense of a year that's larger rather than smaller. So yeah, I, I think that a language model training produces like a very wide diversity of like outputs, some which seem correct to humans and some that don't at all. And we can control for this. To try to synthesize that for myself, I guess what you're saying is because the models in general have not been trained super specifically on this task, and they have not been trained on a super clean data set. You know, that's probably another reason that the frontier models are performing so much better is they probably have a lot cleaner data set than, you know, some of the earlier open source stuff that is accessible for, uh, for this kind of work. But because they have such a mess, you know, kind of going into training, they've learned all these different things and they're all, you know, there's all these kind of sub circuits running in superposition on top of each other. And so actually there are, if, when you zero in on this task, it is actually reasonable to expect that there is some sub-circuit that in isolation could do a better job than the model itself is doing. And your goal with defining a task-specific metric is to zero in on that perhaps even better than baseline model performance by stripping away this other stuff that in fact might be hurting overall performance on this task. Yeah, exactly. I agree entirely. Yeah. And just to put it in perspective, like the number of tokens these models are trained on is just mind blowing. And you imagine, you, or rather you look at the statistics of how long a human would need to spend reading like just text monotonously. It's like orders of magnitude longer than a human lifetime to consume the amount of text that like these models consume and therefore like as like individual humans we like actually cannot model the full diversity of the distributions that like we're training these models on so to me it's like actually not surprising that like there's just a uh, substantially more complexity than there is to human text completion inside of like these uh, like language models that's all my questions on part one. So we have identified a behavior of interest. We have put together a data set that demonstrates it and has some contrasting examples that are similar, but don't have exactly that same critical behavior. And we've got a metric to evaluate it, which could be, you know, by default, just minimal change to the model's output. But we do have some reason to expect that we might even be able to get better performance if we're savvy about defining a a more intentional uh, metric for evaluation. That's a big theme I kind of keep trying to reinforce for folks in general, just th at the base level of, you know, model creation in the first place, that like clever formulation of a loss function has been one of the big unlocks in, you know, the last few years, really, right? Just, just moving to this next, you know, word prediction or next token prediction in the first place was, you know, kind of a, a stroke of genius that allowed for, all the data to be used and but you know it's also it's that's just one loss function and there's certainly a lot more work to be done there to come up with better uh optimization targets so that brings us to part two and this part again i'm, I'm tempted i don't again i don't want to be like overly reliant on analogies but here it does seem like in a lot of different areas of science one of the 
kind of core decisions that you have to make is at what sort of level of zoom or what level of abstraction am I going to study this problem on? So in biology, you know, you've got ecology and you've got, you know, on the other end, like genetics and you've got a lot of layers in between. You know, you can study cells, you can study systems within the body, you can study, you know, an individual organism, you can study a species, you can study, you know, all these different kind of layers. So it seems like there is a, a reasonable, you know, analogy here that you, you kind of have to do the same thing, right? You could look at every single activation, but for multiple reasons, that becomes either computationally intractable or just like too much of a mess. And so you, you have to kind of pick how zoomed in do we want to get uh, for the purposes of this particular analysis. So how can you, can you develop our intuitions a little bit more there for how you think about this decision? Yeah, the analogy to biology, while it's yeah, important to be like um, guarded around giving like analogies to uh, like different fields, I think that like broadly speaking, I expect that like the development of this like mechanistic interpretability field to progress more like biology than like different fields such as physics, because there are like a number of parallels between the like development process of the complex systems inside neural networks that are neural networks essentially uh, and the like evolution process that also like trained on a very like stupid like goal function uh, but then also gave rise to like incredibly complex behaviors along the way and so uh, beginning with an agreement with the analogy here yeah in terms of uh, what is the like choice and how the choice is made in mechanistic interpretability research, I think it's mostly a question of like how uh, ambitious the research is essentially uh, in terms of how they're like pushing this like frontier of the best explanations that we currently have of uh, certain behaviors and certain like behaviors of different complexity with a uh, sufficient like depth and zoom it in, zoom into that like explanation of a behavior and so uh it's a young field and there are really not many researchers doing research on mechanistic interpretability but we already have like a neuron level explanations of how like toy transformers uh, complete the correct completion to like modular addition uh, uh which is worked by like a Neil Nanda and uh, collaborators. And we have much worse understanding, uh, but still some understanding of how GPT-2 small like completes its predictions uh, that are solely in terms of like uh, attention heads and MLPs. And then to give like a third example down the line, uh, other researchers, uh, uh, the paper is called uh, Rome, or uh, like the Eiffel Tower is in Rome, have looked into like the factual uh, recall of models and then edit that recall of models by looking at where facts are stored in terms of whole like attention layers, which include each a bunch of like attention heads uh, like in parallel. And their work groups together whole layers of the like model to then say, well, the uh, factual recall is isolated to these layers. And so really it's a question of like, how ambitious like is your project? And the answer to how ambitious are you is n the correct answer rather is not always like more. Like a, if you try and like explain things at like a really low level and uh, this is just extremely difficult, then it's unlikely that the, like projects will be successful. And so just, I think as a research community, People in mechanistic interpretability research are just trying to like improve this frontier of uh, getting better and better at explaining harder behaviors, but in a more zoomed in way and uh, giving their contribution to the field that way. And so it mostly comes down to like a judgment call on the researchers like part for like where they're aiming at. And so, yeah, that's an example of three different levels. Uh, the neuron level in modular addition work the attention head level in GPT-2 small work covered in our work, but then the attention layer or like several layers level that's explored in different factual recall work. And I think all of these are like pretty good contributions at different parts of like the frontier. And again, it just it seems like there is intuition here around things like, 
you know, the best way to explain the flight of a fly ball is not to go to the quantum mechanical level. So you want to use a level of description that is actually meaningful to the, you know, to the person who's absorbing the output. So in, in some sense, it's like the, you're optimizing for the human audience's ability to understand the results as much as, as anything else. Yeah, and like also as a quantum uh, mechanic, to actually be able to finish your project to explain flight there. Like, I, I wish you luck if you're a quantum mechanic trying to do that, but I also don't expect it to be successful. So uh, that's like the, the trade-off that uh, is being made here. Yeah. So how, in practice, you know, at a conversational level, this sounds sort of, I don't want to say easy, but it sounds like, you know, there's a few levels that you could zoom into that seem pretty natural. And, you know, if we're chatting about this over lunch, we can easily say, well, why don't we try looking at the, you know, attention heads as kind of the, you know, the level of zoom for this particular project. But then obviously, if you have to go back and actually code this and make it sort of, you know, something that can feed into the third step of actually automating the the process of, of isolating these subgraphs. So how hard is that from a coding standpoint or a notation standpoint? That's how, it sounds kind of hard to me. I'm, I know I'm not the world's greatest coder, but I feel like I would have a hard time going from, okay, we've decided we want to zoom in on the attention head level or you know, an ML, individual MLP blocks will be our kind of unit of consideration to then actually figuring out how do I express that in code as a you know causal acyclic graph that's where it starts to sound a little more challenging how hard is it in practice to do that yeah i would say this was uh definitely one of the more fiddly parts of the uh like acdc project to translate these like high level intuitions into something which is like uh able to be modified inside code uh i do think that uh, there are like pretty good libraries. Like, this is mostly a coding question at this point to be able to like extract and edit the internal states of machine learning models. So uh, yeah, with any like when once a researcher has some familiarity with how like a uh, language model forward passes work. It's not so difficult to then add like attachments uh, into your code base to extract those like activations because generally they are represented cleanly. And uh, in our work, we like made a library for researchers to be able to more uh, cleanly edit the impact of like one particular model component specifically on one like later downstream components because that's the part which is somewhat harder from the like implementation perspective uh editing the specific effect uh one earlier model component has on one later model component because by default just uh your like code just runs from end to end and one model component affects all downstream components but to do interpretability you'd like to be somewhat more fine-grained and look at the impact that an earlier uh, upstream component has on each individual downstream component so uh, that's the part that's difficult though it is pretty easy to get at least started with like isolating individual attention heads and there's now a lot of educational material like trying to get more people to do mechanistic interpretability and to like have fun doing these sorts of experiments. The difference here is that if you are trying to just execute procedurally the transformations of the transformer, you sort of take in data, you apply some mechanisms, you know, that ultimately caches out to linear algebra, you take the results and you just kind of keep going, right? But once you're kind of past a certain layer, you can like leave that stuff aside. You don't have to, you know, by default, that inference time, right? You don't necessarily keep track of how layer one interacts with layer eight or whatever. And you don't even necessarily think of it that way in the implementation because you're just kind of doing one thing at a time. It feels like this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and it feels very linear. But there is this kind of conceptual finding, empirical conceptual finding that because of the residual stream, if I understand correctly, actually, you can have critical interactions that do not proceed layer to layer, but actually skip layers or, you know, you have these kind of, if layer, you know, 
obviously I'm just making up fake examples, but you know, if this happens in layer one of this particular network, then layer five also like lights up. And, you know, that's not the kind of thing that the the naive kind of forward pass implementation really looks at. So the hard part is kind of maybe not the hard part, but certainly a conceptual leap that one needs to make here is understanding that like this causal graph is a bit more complicated than just the the direct like procedural implementation. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this was a really beautiful like finding from uh, the Anthropic Interpretability team, so the AI lab that make Claude, that as Nathan, like, as you mentioned, there's a, a residual stream, which uh, in like normal machine learning is usually just referred to as just like the hidden state of the network which is transformed from each layer incrementally. But the researchers at Anthropic uh, realized that if you're uh, implementing a model with residual connections, which just means that once you apply some transformation to this hidden state, you then add the original hidden state back to the transformation. So you incrementally update by adding a transformation of the current state at each step. And this gives you like a whole way to view like the forward paths of transformers and many other models as a continual stream of information, which the model components read from and then write back to. And this is like a really useful finding for like all of the sort of mechanistic interpretability research field that has like this key consequence that we can model the impact that uh, one very early layer component has on like a specific downstream component uh, that is like a really non-trivial finding, but it's really like beautiful once it like makes sense. It's from the Anthropic paper, a mathematical framework for transformer circuits that uh, yeah was a substantial like inspiration for our work that we like added to. I do have I think the the graphical representation that they use in that paper, which presents the residual stream as kind of the central object and then all of these other things as kind of side you know the attention heads and the mlps as kind of side loops that are like making a contribution as opposed to centering those and having this kind of random line that kind of goes around them which is how they're you know so many of the transformers are designed that was definitely an eye-opening and kind of uh, clarifying reframing for me and, and that is in the um early slides of the AI scouting report. So definitely, you know, another good reminder to check that out to get a little bit more grounding on on some of these earlier results. So this ultimately does still sound kind of hard to me because, you know, you have kind of a, a clean forward pass implementation, but now you do have a, a many more kind of paths, uh, causal graph that that ultimately turns into for the purposes of this type of sub-circuit isolation work. We'll come back to that in just a second. One thing I did that jumped out to me also is a, kind of a footnote, but, and this is the kind of thing that may be really obvious to all the, all the practitioners like you who do this every day, but is not necessarily so obvious to people who, you know, are kind of trying to catch up to you, is the idea that all of these circuits are acyclic, meaning there can never be a loop in the design of the circuit it all has to be one way it all has to be you know the kind of language of forward pass and back propagation sort of suggest that but i'm interested in your thoughts a little bit on this kind of cyclicality i guess for one thing you know do anything more to add and then on the, on the other hand like i wonder if that kind of is represents some sort of frontier in model development where if we could figure out how to have some sort of cyclical loop you know, certainly that's something that we have, right? We have some sort of ongoing kind of feedback mechanism where our current state, you know, interacts with our future state and our past states in ways that are not, you know, we're not just like, you know, waking up and executing a single forward pass in isolation each time. So, yeah, I don't, do you have any thoughts on this kind of uh, cyclicality as like, it's a little bit of a digression from the main topic, but does it feel like that is something that will never come online because our techniques just don't support it? Or do you feel like that is maybe, you know, one of uh, a candidate for kind of a, a, another future capabilities unlocked? Yeah, I really like this observation that I think is one that like 
researchers like me who spend like their days trying to like uh, understand these models forgets is like a design choice which has informed all the things that I look at that these models are just like ends to ends rather than like cyclic at all. And so it's, I think it's a great observation. It's just one that I just wouldn't have noticed because I spent all my time working with the like the end to end models. And yeah, like the constraint of back propagation and requiring to have like gradients for each individual component as aggregated end to end does enforce that like the forward pass of the model then just computes like a purely linear process which goes through like different edges but then is always like going forward in some sense and uh yeah like uh, the like mechanistic interpretability research community has mostly focused or is mostly focused at the moment on these transform language models which all like operate under this like uh like acyclic paradigm and uh yeah it's uh certainly just essentially a whole another like dimension which there's no current work on to be able to like unlock some interpretation of which definitely like could be um something which would really like advance our understanding uh particularly because a lot of the current use cases of like uh, language models are maybe not quite like uh a, a like not quite cyclic but certainly more recurrent which means like, like feeding back into themselves uh which like in general mechanistic interpretability hasn't managed to like get a great handle on yet so while we can I mean, we'll talk a lot about the sort of like ability to understand how models produce one token completion and how this is like a really exciting open research direction we don't have much understanding of like how models produce helpful like rollouts of completions so whole like poems or prompts that go on and do some like chain of thought reasoning for example we just don't really know the mechanics of um how the models like using uh its computed new like first token to then produce its computed next token and we also don't have a great understanding of how like these more common like like agents deployed uh, on like the internet, such as the like auto GPT models, how they or if they are meaningfully different from the models that just compute like one forward pass, but instead like these models are continually produced like more and more actions that the model then like tries to like uh, do and then like observe some like a consequence from that action and then acts on that further. So yeah, like a. Uh, uh, all this sort of discussion is premised on like just really like individual single like forward pass completions, and there are ways it could be extended, but we certainly haven't done them. And I'd like love for uh, like future work and future mechanistic intelligibility research to hopefully grapple with like these like harder problems of like recurrence uh, and then plausibly even like cyclic models if people find ways to like make this work with back propagation. Yeah, I kind of see two two more little. Uh, follow-ups in this digression and then we'll get to the you know the core of your contribution what i was kind of if i understand correctly the the core kind of constraint here and the reason for having this no you know cycle no loops uh acyclic constraint is basically that we just want to have easy computation for back propagation right whereas if you so you can kind of work your way back and you know you're only each at each time you can sort of say well we know how all the other stuff already plays out so we're kind of you know using the the chain rule and it's all at each step it's like an easy calculation whereas i guess if you had a loop that would seem to suggest something more like a differential equation type of math dynamic and then you would have just a lot harder math on your hands is that basically the the issue there yeah that that seems correct that uh we like have found this easy way to train models under back propagation and it's certainly not like the optimal way but it's uh, like a common like lesson in like machine learning essentially that uh, a lot of progress is generally gained from pushing simple techniques super far compared to creating incredibly intricate and complex techniques over like long periods of time and so yeah my like a the article by uh rich sutton like a famous like a uh machine learning researcher uh calls this the like bitter lesson that generally uh smart methods in machine learning if they can't like absorb large amounts of computation power lose to much simpler methods 
if the simpler method can scale a lot. So I think this like forward pass and non-cyclic like uh, paradigm of models is probably a consequence of like this simple backprop uh, setup for like language models in fact, being uh, very scalable to like large amounts of compute, whereas cleverer architectures may like bake in better assumptions and in theory have like more useful properties, but aren't as easy to like just scale with a lot of like uh, compute. And so I think that's the focus of like my research, I'd say overall, like focusing on the simple in principle, like uh, techniques that actually scale to like quite formidable uh, consequences. All makes sense. The bitter lesson, we learn it over and over again. What about a change to the loss function on the other hand? So I'm thinking of a recent paper. I'm hoping to, to interview the authors of this one as well. I believe it was out of Stanford where it kind of made the rounds for having a backspace token. That was kind of the headline. Like we introduced a backspace token. Now the model can kind of course correct. I've only read the paper sort of superficially so far, but it also seemed to involve a, a different loss function that they they kind of talked about recasting the process as an imitation learning challenge as opposed to just next token prediction. And therefore, the optimization seems to be over like a longer you know set of tokens. And then that can kind of feed into this ability to do the the backspace action when the results seem to be getting too far outside of, you know, normal distribution. What do you think of it? Does that, how does that kind of loss function switch potentially relate to this kind of mechanistic interpretability work? Hmm. Yeah. I don't think as much as a researcher about the, like sort of the loss function, these like uh, models are trained on like what's the optimal choice for loss function there but i certainly think it's like a really exciting uh, direction for interpretability to try and like choose loss functions that are like more interpretable by default and i think uh, uh i was um i was excited to hear that you spoke with uh, Ziming Liu, who's done some stuff on changing the loss function of models to make them more modular and uh, i think that this work is exciting yeah and it's a uh, uh, not something which I personally worked on, but I always enjoy seeing changes to the default setup, which can hopefully incentivize like uh, models to be more easily amenable to like our explanation techniques. And yeah, I think that one lesson here, which is quite useful, is that it's exciting to have uh, interpretability and mechanistic interpretability techniques that can hopefully work no matter what the sort of like training setup is or how models change. So we'd like to have like approaches which will work even if the sort of like game changes slightly and people do things differently in future. And so this was like a substantial motivation for like the work on just pinning down models computational graph in full generality because this wasn't tied to like um, having the particular uh, transformer architecture that's basically ripped off of the like GPT-2 and GPT-3 papers, but could potentially be used on any sort of model. So yeah, I think that uh, I'm, I think it's a good idea, particularly because machine learning moves so fast, to be open to approaches that will still work if the like board game uh, changes as like machine learning progress uh, continues. So that brings us, you know, and I'm, I'm uh, appreciate all your time and willing to go down some of these rabbit holes with me. But I think that brings us finally to your core contribution, which just zooming out for a second, this three step process of identify a task, have a data set that can demonstrate the task, have a, an optimization uh, goal to evaluate how a sub network is doing against that task. That's all part one, get get set up Two, figure out how to represent your network as this causal graph. And now three, what you have created is a piece of software that can automate the otherwise extremely tedious process of just systematically working its way through all the branches of this graph and figuring out which of these actually do anything and which can we cut as we look to, to zero in on what's actually doing the core part of this work. So. Tell us about how that works. Yeah, cool. That sounds great. We got so into just like uh, explaining the sort of like side tangents of why mechanistic interpretability research is 
done all these things but uh that was far longer than a necessary introduction to like what like the contribution of acdc so automatic circuit discovery is uh since uh acdc is really just like a three-step algorithm that like imitates the human process for trying to interpret neural networks but does this just via like a software rather than requiring a human in the loop and so given all the like extensive description of the uh setup that we went through the three steps are firstly selecting this computational graph at some level of abstraction and then uh at uh, like a given uh, node in that like out like that graph, uh, looking at all the like input edges to the node in that graph, and one by one like removing them by setting their like activation to the activation on the baseline data set, and then measuring whether setting the activation along this particular edge uh, to the baseline data set uh, decreases the like model's performance on the downstream metric by a given like uh, amount. And if this is a like a large decrease in model performance, then we keep this edge in the graph. But if it didn't seem to matter at all, we can remove this edge. And that's like the step two, which we then just recurse in the third step through all the nodes. So that's like the high level overview of or all of ACDC, but it really is just like three steps to find a, a subgraph of the model's whole computational graph. So you've got this process for kind of neutralizing components of the graph, asking how does performance compare on the output metric, and then if the performance is sufficiently degraded, then we decide, okay, that's one we need to keep. Whereas if it's not sufficiently degraded, then okay, we can throw that away. So I guess two questions there. One is like just procedurally, you have all these different kind of length connections, right? Like if I'm starting at the end, you know, my last MLP block or whatever, it's influenced by all previous layers, but those are mediated through the residual stream. So what does it actually mean to say, if I'm looking at, okay, the connection between the eighth you know, and final, let's say, MLP block and the first detention layer, that's all kind of, you know, the direct connection there being mediated through the residual stream where all this other information is also flowing. What does it mean to knock that part out? Like you can't take the whole residual stream out, right? So what does that actually look like to cut that kind of connection? Sure. So in the example of a very early layer attention head, for example, that might be just one of the uh, things that are, are the inputs to one late layer MLP. We would generally write the uh, inputs to that MLP as the sum of like all the previous components, because as mentioned in the residual stream, the inputs to the MLP is just the sum of all the previous components that have added to the residual stream. So if we want to corrupt the uh, effect that this singular attention head in the early part of the model has on this like far downstream component, like an MLP, what we can do is we can take the uh, inputs into this attention, sorry, this MLP at the end, we can then subtract this clean contribution from the early attention head and then add in the like corrupted uh, output of this attention head. And then this will preserve all the other clean activations, which are the inputs to this MLP, and will just corrupt the contribution which comes from that one early attention head. And so, yeah, that's the process that we use to like edit just this singular connection from, in this example, an attention head to an MLP. Let's go back to the years example. So you're looking at the greater than task, you know, the, the war went from 1517 to 15 blank. And you've got your contrasting 
example, which might be the war went from 1500 to 15 blank, such that, you know, you're not, you don't necessarily need to do the greater than because it's going to be some, you know, and any two digit number there would work, right? So you then have a situation where you're like, all right, I, I've got all my activations for the actual greater than task. I've got all my activations for the kind of very comparable, but not requiring the actual greater than operation task. I hear you. I get, I get the idea that, okay, I can express all the inputs to a late layer as the sum of all the outputs from the earlier layer. If I switch, oh, you're only doing one adjustment to the sum at a time. So like, if you're just looking at this one layer, I'm a little confused still about if I were to change the outputs, those would also change how each middle layer of computation actually works, right? But you're not doing that. So like if I'm if I'm looking at the connection between layer one and layer eight, I'm not necessarily changing the sum for the purposes of looking at layer seven. Is that right? Yes, you're totally correct that we do not edit the effects that in the example, the early attention head has on all the middle components. And to provide an implementation detail, which might help to understand the process here, we actually simply cache the corrupted value and the clean value of this early attention head. And the benefits of caching are that we can run the forward pass up to this final MLP without having done any changes to that early attention head. But then once we're at this uh, MLP, we have the cached clean and corrupted value. So now that we can like force this MLP to have like uh, essentially seen the corrupted value, even when in the whole forward pass so far, we just had the uh, like the early attention head, for example, on the like clean input. So it's a matter of caching those two, uh, like saving them as in your like Python code. Just nothing more complicated than that. So that then once we're at the downstream node, then we can do the editing, and this ensures separation of the effects of the early attention head on the middle components separate from the effect of the early attention head on this particular MLP. So again, what I, what I understand you need to be doing for starters to be make sure I have this straight is defining how much degradation in performance on our optimization metric will we tolerate. And if it's if the degradation is below that level of tolerance, then we'll cut that portion of the graph. But I, I was kind of confused because I was kind of thinking you know, different tasks, different graphs, everything might be so different. Does it make sense to make that kind of the the free parameter? Or would it make more sense if it were tractable? I'm not, I'm, you know, this is where my abstract math isn't quite strong enough always to know what's going to work or not. But I kind of felt myself wanting to reframe the question a little bit and say, how sparse can I make this graph? How much can I cut it while still maintaining some overall level of performance? So why why set that kind of individual kind of operation, you know, bit by bit uh, threshold as opposed to some kind of global notion of how sparse can we go while still like succeeding at the task? Yeah, this is a fantastic question because I would much rather have an algorithm which chooses the sparsity of the graph and then gives you back a subgraph that has that sort of sparsity. And the reason that instead we just have like a threshold which measures like the uh, amount that a single edge matters is purely like a tractability question that we don't know like how to design an algorithm which like at the end, or at least I don't know at this point in time, that like at the end will give me like this like graph that's sufficiently sparse, let's say, but it, in the process like aims like robustly towards that conclusion because uh like in advance you just don't know which of the huge number of subgraphs will be the one that like uh is the best at like uh explaining how the model does a task and i think this is uh like a general machine learning iterative uh, optimization problem that a 
really we would like to specify what like we want in the end, but this doesn't really uh, uh, give us like a tractable way of getting there. Are you just asking for like a sub x or y sparse graph, this this amount of sparsity in your end graph? But like if you just immediately select a graph with that sparsity, it just will be like in general, like absolutely hopeless at the task. And so we need like an iterative way to get there. And this could be gradient descent, or this could be the sort of ACDC algorithm, which goes node by node. But uh, it just is like a, a pretty hard problem to like uh, have uh, that like end goal be a useful target through the optimization process. So your intuition is completely correct that uh, we would rather have like a this level of sparsity graph, but instead what we've got is this like a proxy measure of the like local uh, corruption amount that's allowed. But it certainly um, can give you some indication of how sparse the end graph will be, because the ACDC iterative process first will process the output node. So once you've run with a particular threshold, you'll be able to see like how many nodes it's added to the output connection. And this will provide some guide to then how many nodes will be upstream, because like, you'll likely, if you have like one half of the nodes uh, outputting to the end connection, then it seems like you're going to have a pretty dense graph overall that's going to include most of those connections. Whereas if it's including just like two of the nodes and you like, for example, wanted a substantially more, like that was not enough for you and you thought there were more components that mattered, you could increase it. So while sadly we don't have a like a, a hyper parameter which can give us the exact sparsity of the end result, the early like performance of the algorithm does give you some indication of how sparse the end result will be. But uh, yeah, it's a great concern. Uh, I hope people in the future can make a version which gives graphs of like a specified uh, sparsity. But for now, we like uh, don't have a method of doing this. So for now, you're kind of sweeping through the parameter space for what that threshold should be, and then kind of eyeballing initial results and kind of saying, well, when I set the threshold such that it tolerates a lot of degradation, like everything got cut, and it looks like this has kind of gone too far, versus if I set it, you know, to only tolerate a tiny bit, then you might see something that looks still super dense and be like, doesn't feel like it's gone far enough. And you're kind of using a certain amount of taste to kind of figure out where in that trade off you want to be. Yeah, I think there's a good distinction here between two ways in which we like tested the uh, ACDC algorithm that involved uh, like validation tests, which swept over a huge number of parameters to see what the like best performance was for like this algorithm in different regimes, like in the very sparse regime to the like pretty dense regime was uh, like one thing that happened. But then we also tested like uh, at least like, a use case where this was used in practice by like researchers who were trying to find like uh, a particular uh, behavior of a model and where it was computed in the graph. And in this case, you're not so worried about like, the sweep over all possible parameters. You're looking for like a revealing subgraph, which helps you like begin your like research into like how a model is doing a particular task. So I think there's like two modes there that like in the work in machine learning work, you need to like validate that like actually your technique is helpful for recovering circuits. But then in practice, you can do uh, like a early stopping essentially once you found something which is revealing uh, how models do certain tasks. Yeah, I think the, the two ways that you validated the results are super interesting to me as well. The I was a little bit surprised by the the order of presentation, not that that's like the most important, but when I think about how would I, you know, I've come up with this technique, like how would I demonstrate that it actually works? To me, the obvious thing is like, show that it can continue to do the original thing, you know, as well, or not so much worse, or maybe even in certain circumstances better than the fully dense graph. That, that part makes total intuitive sense to me. But you 
Is there a reason that you kind of prioritize the other one for discussion earlier? The other one being looking at what folks like Neil Nanda have actually found through their own, you know, non-automated painstaking approaches and kind of comparing what the algorithm, the ACDC algorithm isolates to what they isolated by hand. Why was that like the the first place to to go for validation? Yeah, that's a good question. So just to clarify the um, experiment that was performed, it was a uh, experiment to see how well uh, the ACDC technique as well as uh, differing techniques that we like repurposed from like the literature, were able to like find the circuits that previous work found. I don't think it actually included an example from uh, like the Neil Nanders line of work, but it did include, for example, the uh, the greater than year example that we discussed a lot. And I think we chose this measure, the uh, measure of how much our technique reproduce the uh, other like uh, work that practitioners had done was that our motivation was to like make something which is helpful for mechanistic interpretability research that is like the first step in the process of like actually giving semantic meaning to the different components in models and like what these components are doing and so i think that it is helpful to get some indication of how performance your like subgraph is that you mentioned as the second like evaluation that we chose, but the purpose of the like ACDC algorithm was certainly something that we hoped practitioners would use to like explain models rather than like get models that are just like really good at predicting years because this is not something which like <laughs> is actually um, like uh, useful to people like. How good is your model at predicting years? So uh, our priority was like the um, first step on the path to understanding the semantic meaning of components. And high performance is maybe correlated with that, but it's not exactly as direct as just finding the important components that like researchers had like in practice found were like the semantically meaningful components. So I hope that makes sense as like a, the two different evaluations and why we were excited about reproducing previous work, though it is certainly flawed and we can get into that if need be. If I understand clearly, it's kind of a an audience driven thing where you your goal is to create a tool that will be adopted by interpretability researchers and to convince them that this is actually meaningful. You wanted to show that you could recreate earlier results that they all know about and you know hold in high regard. Yeah, I'd say it's true that it's an audience problem, but I, I want to clarify that I'm not like overselling this approach. In terms of an approach for finding like the best subcircuits that do different like behaviors, like correct years, this would probably not be a very competitive approach because we're doing these interventions on like the edges that involve like a substantial amount of caching and recomputation that would be inefficient compared to other ways you could like elicit uh, model capabilities because it's just like a substantially larger amount of compute. So that's just like not really the like uh, the area that we're like competing for to make a good technique. We're competing for something different, which is like the uh, sim- like the for the discovery of the semantically meaningful components. So I'm not oversetting my work. I do think it would be a very good algorithm for getting very good subgraphs at particular tasks, but it wasn't the goal ever either. So that would contrast to like the Ziming Liu from the Techmark uh, group work that we talked about earlier, where they are taking a, a different approach, modifying the loss function during the training process to kind of create sparse networks by design is that kind of what you're contrasting against like that would be the approach to finding the you know the sparsest network that can do a task and and you are instead trying to create a tool that can kind of also do that but is doing that already downstream of like this very messy training process so it's not really optimized for the best possible circuit but it's it's optimized for finding what circuits do in practice exist given current techniques yeah, I think this is a useful distinction between um, post hoc interpretability, which uh, our work is like an example of, and uh, like training process interpretability, 
or like selecting for interpretability that I think that the seeming Lu work is a great example of. So here we're assuming we have some fixed model and it's a black box. We want to like open up the, the black box to understand what's happening within it. That's just like the premise of the work. But uh, like complementary work, a different direction you could take is, yeah, like designing training processes that incentivize like interpretability through like modular structure in that example. And I just think these two approaches complement each other because on one hand, if the architectures that like we were studying were more comprehensible, and uh, then this would just make our job or more modular rather, this would make mechanistic interpretability much easier. But at the same time, uh, work that's building into the loss function, some hopeful notion of interpretability does need to be validated to actually be interpretable down the line because models can learn uh, like strange solutions which appear interpretable but are not in reality as interpretable and some work by anthropic on a technique called solu as an activation function instead of relu or gelu is actually an example where the researchers try to like choose a training process which led to a more interpretable model but found that the model was like hiding its like superposition in this case via like a confusing route that uh, they had created by like introducing their new technique so i think that to reiterate the two paradigms of uh like post hoc interpretability and designing training processes for interpretability are like complementary and uh different uh in terms of uh, like uh, approaches that you would take to like try and reach both of those goals it's just important to keep in mind that like sparsity does not necessarily mean it's super interpretable and certainly doesn't mean that it's like generalized in a way that you know we would consider to be like grokking or you know sort of representative of some like more fundamental you know non-stochastic parrot understanding it could, you could have sparsity and still have all those other problems at the same time. Cool. Well, then let's talk a little bit. You kind of alluded to it for a second um, about like the compute that goes into this. How much compute did this take? Like, what kind of resources do you need? How accessible is this kind of stuff? You know, do the techniques that you have today scale up to large scale models if you just have enough compute, or is there not enough compute in the world to you know to apply something like this to a GPT three? Tell me about just kind of, you know, all the compute considerations with this line of work. Sure. So this work was done with computes that was uh, mostly from just like a FAR AI. So like a um, research group that uh, one of the collaborators, uh, Adria Garigor Alonso, works with. And so this was not like a super cluster of like one of the huge labs that we were working with. And we could see practitioners get results on the like the GPT-2 small large language model uh, in like half an hour or like an hour of like uh, runs when they worked super well and were like pretty sparse. Though there are definitely cases where compute is somewhat of a bottleneck to ACDC and particular scaling it. So the two cases that come to mind are that when you like don't select the threshold appropriately and you include lots of edges, then you tend to have to search through every single node of the computational graph. And since your like computation is like roughly linear in the number of like nodes uh, that are present, this becomes extremely expensive as uh, your technique uh, includes and searches through each node. So the first case is when, like, yeah, you um, don't choose, like, the correct threshold. And this sometimes can be frustrating and then leads to slow runs and slow feedback loops that uh, we hope that, like, future work will be able to work on. GPT-2 small is how many parameters? Like, 10 million? Yeah, so that's the second sort of worry about the, like, um, compute uh, that GPT-2 small is a 100 million parameter model. So this is, like, large given like statistical models or things that people used 10 years ago but it's incredibly small compared to the like hundreds of billions of gpt3 and larger models and because our technique is like a iterative over all the no all the edges in fact which scale almost like 
with the square of the number of nodes involved. Currently, this is not feasible at all for like a GPT-3 size model and uh, isn't really even very uh, efficient for models that are like at the billions of parameters. So we're not able really to scale up an order of magnitude beyond GPT small at current. I at least am excited for further interpretability research to hopefully scale to those sizes. And uh, already people have done some interpretability work on the like alpaca model, so like a seven billion parameter model. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I know of a number of like follow up works to this like work that could plausibly uh, be able to scale up to that size. Uh, while automatically finding circuits. So uh, an open problem, essentially. I would like to see more work on it. Yeah, interesting. So uh, even with GPT-2 small, though, I assume we're not using the individual neurons as the as the nodes, right? So it's there's still some zoom out. So how, could you give an intuition for how that kind of number of nodes scales with model size? It seems like there's a, almost a different scaling law you know or different scaling intuition that one needs to develop here right because it seems like more layers would definitely have a big difference so even even like with a certain number of parameters you know kind of depending on the the width and the number of layers you could maybe set things up where the the number of edges to consider actually could vary potentially quite a bit yeah that's a good point i hadn't uh, even considered that in the discussion that uh, in fact, almost all of our research in the like the main text of our paper focused on the abstraction level of the important attention heads and uh, the important MLPs in these like large language models, rather than being more specific or to the individual neurons of these large language models or the um, like attention layers that would be less specific. I was solely talking about the um, abstraction level of the individual attention heads and MLPs uh, and connections between them, including, in fact, the individual like uh, query and key and value paths that are like the inputs to attention heads. For example, we were able to isolate those. And I think that this is roughly mirroring the pace of progress of people's interpretability projects. Because after all, it is just like last year that uh, I, I was like fortunate to work with collaborators on the uh, uh, the IOI or interpretability in the wild paper, which was the, the first work that was able to reverse engineer a circuit inside GPT two small. And then this year we now have the greater than circuits in GPT two small, for example. So. Yeah, and these works are both at this attention head and MLP level, which is like uh, the only um, like the point at which we can do uh, experiments on GPT too small with ACDC. Like, I think it would still be too slow because there would be too many connections if you were looking at individual neurons. But the existing interpretability research hasn't really been able to uh, understand uh, these GPT two models on neuron level. So yeah, uh, some. It's a sort of a bad news and good news there, I suppose, for like understanding GPT two neurons with ACDC. Even keeping that level of abstraction, you know, where the focus is on the attention heads and the and the MLP blocks. If you were to do try to take the leap, you know, a thousand x parameters, right, from whatever order of magnitude one hundred million on GPT two small to order of magnitude one hundred billion on Llama two or GPT three or what have you. How does the compute requirement of this process scale? Does it go as like the square of the increase? Like does a thousand fold increase in parameters end up being like a million fold increase in compute or? Yeah, I think it's on average slightly worse than like uh, scaling with the square of the number of like nodes or parameters you're introducing. Uh, obviously nodes and parameters are not the same but this is because as you increase like the number of nodes by a factor of two say you're roughly increasing the number of edges in the graph by a factor of four because these networks are highly connected 
Like uh, it turns out that your layer zero heads have an impact on almost all downstream layer heads. And so as you increase the like, yeah, the number of nodes by a factor of two, you roughly increase the number of uh, edges by a factor of four. And because this algorithm is iterative over the, each of the edges, this leads to like, yeah, like the quadratic uh, increase. And then like your whole uh, forward pass is now more expensive as well because you're dealing with a bigger model, which accounts for something on top of the um, quadratic cost of more iterations. But uh, it, I don't think would give you, uh, like, I mean, like, yeah, it, it turns out that the process of just iterating over each edge is the slow pass of this network, like the bottleneck, rather than the forward pass cost. So that turns out to be the biggest bottleneck. In practice, how easy have you guys made this today? You know, for somebody who obviously has a, an interest in the subject, but, you know, have, I definitely feel like I have some weaknesses when it comes to notation and, you know, I'm not the greatest uh, at managing like a ton of indexes, you know, it's, there's a lot of indexes to manage when you're doing this kind of work. Is the work that you've put out like developed enough where somebody like me can actually get in there and do it? Or like how, how much of a burden still remains for, you know, the kind of casual investigator to get in and, and start to figure some stuff out? Yeah, we try to uh, make our library um, like well written uh, for like all practitioners by like building it on top of a really great mechanistic interpretability library called a transformer lens. So a transformer lens, which you can like find on GitHub, is a library which makes um, mechanistic interpretability of generative language models far easier than the default implementations in like a hugging face, for example, or in online tutorials. And so it was originally developed by Neil Nanda, who again has like helped a lot with making this mechanistic interpretability field uh, easy to skill up in and uh, have a bunch of like tractable research directions. So it's thanks to him for this sort of resource. But uh, now the ACDC library can load uh, any of the models that are in the transformer lens library uh, as a computational graph with all of the connections between the uh, like nodes as different edges. So this includes like the whole GPT-2 line of models, as well as um, a bunch of the like smaller toy language models that have been found by like Eleuther AI in the Pythia models, for example, and some of uh, a bunch of toy models that have different activation functions, such as the like the Gelu and Solu activation function. So uh, out of the box, you can use this thing with uh, a ton of language models that are available for mechanistic interpretability researchers in the like transformer lens library. And this includes like models like the Llama models, but we think that probably ACDC will be a little bit too slow on these larger models uh, for now. And so like we're excited to see uh, future work and scale it up. If all goes according to plan, we're going to presumably see people starting to isolate a lot of subgraphs. What would you say then is the state of our ability to actually make sense of these subgraphs? Is that my understanding is that remains like a very artisanal sort of process and kind of has its own workflow of like trying to figure out what algorithm this, you know, really instantiates and, you know, is it something that constitutes understanding all that is kind of in the eye of the beholder. There's these various techniques around like editing and looking for behavioral change. There's like probes, you know, to kind of try to figure out what internal states, you know, actually map onto to real world states that maybe the model didn't even necessarily see in its training data. But how, how in, like in general, are these things like, do we get to a satisfying conclusion for most of these subgraphs that we identify or not so much? Yeah, I think this is mostly like an open question, and I'm excited to see work that provides evidence like either way for hopefully the um, interpretability of just these like just raw subgraphs of huge numbers of attention heads and NLPs, or that like they would be somehow misleading or confusing and not useful. Because this would be a useful piece of evidence that like mechanistic interpretability is hard. And like so far, the use case that we found uh, with like a practitioner who used this to find out whether like 
the GPT-2 small model was able to produce completions that were like uh, the correct gender of uh, different uh, like names in the sentence or expected gender. So it would turn like a ordinary like, uh, names of women into like the she pronoun. So this was just like the bias essentially of the model to expect that as a completion and ordinary uh, male pronouns, uh, male names rather, into he. So again, like a bias of the model to produce that completion. Then like revealed this structure the model was like aggregating information about this like name on like this surprising next token to the name. So the model will just like take the name information and then move that to like the next token in the residual stream. So a different residual stream. And then that would be what would be like would be like funneled downstream into like the like a normal like a, a gender completion, uh, like the he or she completion that was expected based on the like the biases and the training data. And so this was a case where uh, the like the ACDC algorithm could have gave like a confusing mess as to like how the model did this particular pronoun completion, but actually was like fairly interpretable. And, oh, it was aggregating information on this like position that was the like uh, the, the token after the name, and the researcher could clearly see that through like a bunch of the MLPs, and then could like make that conclusion, which was certainly like a, a non-trivial conclusion. And would have taken a long time to find by like hand, since it's like a computation which occurs like in the internals of the model. Like it's not a function of the input, and it's not like something which is a function of the output. It's just this internal position which matters a ton. And so, in the limited examples we have so far, it turned out to be a pretty easy process. But I expect there are definitely cases where it's much harder and I'd like to see like further evidence whether it's in general a lot easier or in general still quite hard. Fascinating. I'm trying to kind of envision that and I certainly appreciate the importance of these internal states which you know some might be bold enough to call emergent uh, properties or emergent behaviors. Do you have a take on the I guess I'll just call it the emergence discourse? Yeah on emergence it's Definitely a concept which is um, attractive to talk about because of its like connection to unpredictability and the uh, like longer term worries that different AI like or new AI systems will be qualitatively like different from current AI systems. And I do think that it is, however, often a question of which metric you choose to measure your property under. So abilities of large language models often seem emergent when we look at token completions that our like billion parameter model, for example, can suddenly do three digit addition. Like we give it three digit three digit addition sums and it can now like suddenly be able to like generally produce the correct answer, whereas like the 100 million parameter models can produce just like rubbish on the same outputs. And this feels to us like something that's emergent because like suddenly the model's great at this and previously it was like absolutely hopeless. But often when you like hear these statistics or read these papers about the emergent capabilities of models, they're solely looking at a particular metric. Like in this case, the probability that the model gives the correct like addition completion. And Actually, language models and models generally are trained on the logarithm of the uh, probability that the model gives to certain completions. And so uh, often follow-up research has found, that, like in, uh, it's been called like a mirage in one paper, that once you're looking at like the logarithm of the probability that the model gets the correct uh, three-digit addition sum correct, for example, then progress looks really smooth. And uh, it just increases uh, like gradually in like the log of the number of parameters of the model. But it just happens to be that like exponential growth is extremely fast. And so at one moment, you're at like 1% likelihood of producing the correct addition sum. And then suddenly you're like timesing by like uh, 50 or whatever, and we're at 50%. And this looked like it was a qualitative change and came out of nowhere. But really, you were just staring at like the wrong metric. And so my broad take is that for now, we are not very good at like finding the right metrics to measure models under. 
And so we resort to just looking at their outputs and sampling what happens. Even the like best evaluations that exist, the like team from the Alignment Research Center who found a bunch of like somewhat dangerous capabilities of GPT-4 still like, in general use the technique of just looking at what the model's outputs were. And we should expect that these like probabilities on completions are growing like exponentially uh, in the sort of like scaling curve because we train on like logarithm of the probability of the completions. And so I think that currently we're likely to see more emergence, but it's mostly because we're looking at the wrong metrics. And uh, I'm certainly excited about uh, digging deeper into the internals of models through interpretability or other methods because of the fact that by default, I expect we'll see emergence, but we could do so much better. Yeah, that's a fascinating. I've, I've been kicking this question of emergence around from a bunch of different angles as well and trying to just figure out, first of all, like what matters. And I guess one way to maybe think about what matters, tell me if you see this differently, is just asking like how practical is it to zoom in on these things in in the process of training? Because I guess I, my intuition is that you know, what really matters for like users, society, companies, you know, is at the end of a training process, what can a model do or not do? And how general is that capability? And, you know, is it grokked in some way that reflects a meaningful understanding? Or is it still stochastic parrot? That seems like the key thing that like matters most. It does seem to be true that, you know, per that Mirage paper, that if you find one of these kind of surprises and then rewind and say, well, okay, let me actually measure that performance at every, every, you know, increment of the training process. Then you can plot like a smoother curve. And it seems like there's this kind of phase change that is often happening between like a correlation paradigm and a more algorithmic paradigm. And those are kind of, you know, one is, is dropping while the other is rising. And that does from what I've seen often take like, like an order of magnitude more training to to make that phase change, or sometimes even more, perhaps. But it seems like it's still gonna be really hard. You know, if you're if you're training a system like GPT-4, first of all, you don't know what list of as you're training it, you don't know what things will like emerge that you could then later come back and plot a smooth curve on. So you're gonna have a hard time knowing what things to even look at, you know, incrementally along the way. And then just like the compute tax of that, you know, if you were to say every batch, I want to like run a million diagnostics and, you know, kind of benchmark a thousand you know, or a million things, or whatever, at every step, like that becomes like massive overhead. So I kind of look at that Mirage paper and I'm like, you definitely found something that is quite helpful to understanding what's going on in the training process. But from the standpoint of like society or even model developers, it doesn't feel like that allows us to get around this problem of we don't know what's going to come out of the model at the end of a big training run, or at least not without like a significant overhead imposed on the training process. Would you challenge anything there or correct me on anything? No, I definitely agree that uh, it seems an extremely difficult problem to predict what are essentially like unknown, unknown capabilities that we don't like we don't just don't know how far training on predicting next words and then maybe being rlhf fine-tuned on top of that gets us in the limit like how many capabilities does this actually get us will this solve like will this be like competitive with the best humans at maths for example or will it never reach anywhere close to like a like a graduate math student i, I don't know what the answer is here and so therefore I agree that, and there are just like so many other tasks in a, like a ballpark like that, that plausibly could emerge or plausibly can't. So we, don't, we just don't know where, where they'll come from. But I think that I am more concerned about mostly known unknowns uh, in the like evaluation space of different evaluations of things models can do. As like an example, um, a lot of uh, AI safety research has established like a that there are often like uh, convergent uh, instrumental goals that models will have. 
So if the end training target involves uh, one of a huge number of objectives, it is useful for the models to gain like power or resources to uh, achieve those goals because power and resources uh, are just like very helpful for a huge number of things that the model could want to do, such as like convincing people to send certain messages on the internet or acquiring certain like uh, like uh, objects on the internet or something. Uh, you would like to have more money and more influence to get those things. And so my take here is that we don't just we don't need to look for the unknown unknown capabilities to have um, helpful. Uh, evaluations and predictions of different model capabilities. We can sort of think about these known unknowns of like concepts which theoretically are likely to emerge through sufficient training because of the like instrumental convergence arguments. But then current models don't do very much, like seek power essentially. So once once we restrict to a certain number of capabilities that seem could be like quite dangerous if we have future powerful AIs, then I hope that we can develop better evaluations to figure out how close or how far our current models are from doing these like certain uh, dangerous, like uh, or gaining these certain dangerous capabilities that are like known purely from the theoretical angle for now. This, this debate kind of always comes up around interpretability, maybe not always, but I think it's personally just fascinating work that you know i'm very curious about kind of independent of its consequences you know for me it just passes the uh you know it's interesting on its own merits test but you know as i mentioned at the top to me it feels like it's a pretty promising path to safety it seems like you're kind of sketching out like a vision of sort of the holy grail of mechanistic interpretability at least for safety purposes would be to figure out how models might implement some of these most concerning behaviors and then be able to detect that the formation of those subgraphs in the training process that would be like you know the the dream scenario right any anything to add to that yeah this sounds like exactly what i think of as like a uh speculative but like incredibly beneficial application of like the mechanistic interpretability techniques that like I and a number of other researchers and my collaborators have worked on. So I, I agree with this characterization. And I will just like point out that I, I'm, I'm well aware that this like problem that's been sketched out where uh, there are no theoretical dangerous capabilities that powerful AI systems could have can definitely be approached with like other approaches to safety. We don't need to have a mechanistic understanding of AIs to be able to like hopefully steer them like away from dangerous capabilities or at least know when the dangerous capabilities are present. But it's certainly the case that mechanistic interpretability has like a uniquely like a uniquely specific approach to like isolating and understanding those capabilities because it would hopefully be able to explain those capabilities in terms of the exact like location in models and the exact reasons for why this capability emerged rather than just like a litmus test that goes like positive or negative for whether this capability is there. So that's like the the wider dream of uh, like interpretability uh, with regard to like uh, applications and safety. What do you make of the argument that I that I do sometimes hear that is like, yeah, but everything's kind of dual use and yeah, we can understand this stuff better, but also that's just going to feed into accelerating the increasing power of systems in general. And so, you know, maybe it's not so good. Um, I don't find that super compelling. I don't really have a great knockdown reason for it other than just I don't know what else to do but try because it certainly seems like everything is progressing regardless, right? So I wouldn't... Um, pin, you know, the sort of potential for a runaway kind of loss of control scenario on mechanistic interpretability by any means. Yeah, I want to be careful because I guess we both have a similar opinion here that uh, I also like don't find the arguments for the danger of mechanistic interpretability research uh, extremely compelling. And since we both sort of perhaps have this opinion, I don't want to misrepresent the opposite view. But to me, it seems like the vast majority of capability gains in machine learning that have been relevant to the development of the most powerful systems 
have not come from advances in transparency or insights about like, how models work. Uh, there's a great um, discussion of this exact question in like a alignment forum research post on pragmatic AI safety, which discusses that uh, like you can just survey where capability gains to vision models in machine learning and to language models in the machine learning have come from. And the vast majority have come from basically engineering hacking to find something which works slightly better than the alternatives, while no one really understands why this works slightly better than the alternatives, such as picking a loss function that's just predicting the next token that turns out to work really well at absorbing capabilities, or in the like RLHF process to pick a reward which just chooses between zero and one. It's just like a preference between one and the other thing. To me, these things didn't like arise from a deep understanding of how to model language or how to model human preference. But as far as I understand it, arose from trying a number of alternatives and then eventually selection pressure leading to these being the best of the bunch. And so under this worldview of progress in machine learning, I think that currently mechanistic interpretability is very unlikely to contribute to like the bulk of further performance improvements in like uh, machine learning models. I guess that's my first um, disagreement with the perspective that uh, mechanistic interpretability could be dangerous for its dual use to making ever more powerful like AI systems. And then my second like uh, disagreement with the perspective that mechanistic interpretability uh, could be like harmful overall is that I think that mechanistic interpretability if it works, like this is all premised under it, like being useful, because currently we haven't found like a stellar application to the models that matter, but we hope we can get there. This second reason that uh, I think it has like a greater positive side to a negative side is that it plausibly gives us a way of like designing and understanding AI systems in a different way to the current understanding of systems, such that we could develop maybe more powerful AI systems. Like this is the, the worry, but they would actually be understandable to us. Like we would understand how these AIs are like computing the outputs that they're like processing from the inputs. And to me, this may involve more powerful AIs, but would substantially reduce the like risks of deploying these systems because a lot of the risks from like the alignments of uh, AI systems come from being able to specify your objective and trying to get something from an AI system, but not understanding the process through which the AI system achieves that end goal. And this essentially is like the alignment problem that uh, specifying the end state isn't enough because it either is really hard to specify that end state, like as an outer alignment problem in the jargon, or the AI system learns a solution which was just totally unintended and maybe internally optimizes uh, that is like this inner alignment problem, even if you chose the right goal. But to me, interpretability and mechanistic interpretability could be like a way, if it can work, to develop AI systems where we understand that middle like process between our like specification of the goal, like the goal of the system and the AI system being able to like actually execute and like achieve that goal. So that's my like two reasons for being optimistic about uh, the uh, impact of like mechanistic interpretability research. When I try to envision what that might look like, you know, a, a a future that sort of combines better understanding, hopefully better control, but also, you know, increasing power and, you know, maybe power per unit compute or whatever. First thing that comes to mind is kind of a mixture of experts, mixture of sparse experts sort of architecture. I'm kind of imagining something where, you know, take like the, the Zeming blue paper we've talked about a couple of times that are, you know, creating these very small, but like very sparse and kind of crystalline almost looking subgraphs and 
you know, scaling that up where there's some sort of mechanism where you've got a lot of those and you only use, you know, a certain number at a time. And so you can kind of see like what was what modules were loaded in to, to handle this particular case. What do those things do? It seems like that is like potentially pretty promising to me. Is that how does that relate to your kind of obviously still somewhat vague uh, vision for what might eventually come online? Yeah, I think this is an example, like a nicely concrete example of like a really like ambitious goal of interpretability where like the whole architecture of the like the forward pass can be understood to a human or at least, yeah, like these high level uh, concepts, like the whole uh, routing to a particular expert has some like meaning to humans. And I think it's possible that we can get to this stage with mechanistic interpretability. But I think it's worth noting that even if this like fails pretty badly, it's still possible for the interpretability of narrow tasks, like the mentioned power seeking in certain scenarios, can be achieved like through like mechanistic interpretability. Like there could plausibly be a circuit which does this particular power seeking task. And having like just understood that circuit in a network, we can like uh, understand why the training process got to this solution, or we can just remove that circuit entirely before we deploy a system. And I don't think this is like ideally what like my future looks like, as in, oh man, we have like this like misaligned system, but we'll just like remove that part and deploy it anyway. But I think that there are ways which this uh, is like a graceful degradation of the like ambitious goal of just having a whole architecture which makes sense like an understanding of the dangerous capabilities so we can at least remove those dangerous capabilities even if we don't have an understanding of all capabilities of the model well you've been extremely gracious with your time i have maybe one more question i'll give you a chance to if you want to touch on anything else we haven't but what are you looking at you know i, I kind of try to keep my eye on the horizon in my you know self uh, proclaimed role as ai scout you know i'm kind of always looking for what is happening that maybe isn't being talked about a ton yet but seems like it has kind of transformative potential are there things that you see right now or you know are or keep or maybe you haven't seen but are keeping an eye out that you think could kind of change the game so to speak either to make things a lot easier perhaps you know so that you know maybe something like the zooming strategy becomes mainstream and things become much more easy to interpret or on the flip side you mentioned like recurrence you know makes things harder there was just this paper in the last few days um i believe out of microsoft research around retention they propose a somewhat different mechanism which i don't really understand yet but they are bold enough to call it a possible successor to the transformer um seems like you know there's potential here for paths of and this may be a, an indication too that the history in its particulars could end up really mattering if you can imagine like there may be and it seems to me very likely that there is or there are multiple very viable architectures to be found just starting with the fact that we have the human brain that works pretty well and we have the transformer that works pretty well probably other things that are going to work pretty well and it seems like some of those things may be much more or much less amenable to being understood. So I wonder what you're kind of, you know, keeping your eye out for in terms of things that could, you know, kind of shake the snow globe or, you know, kind of rearrange the the game board in a substantial way. Yeah, that's a really good question about like uh, looking forward. What are like the things that uh, like I'm thinking about looking for? And I think that um, like it's worth others having on their radar. And in terms of like, yeah, mechanistic interpretability and interpretability research, I think a common theme which I would expect to be part of a lot of the like the next generation of um, contributions to the field will involve more higher level motifs in language models. So we spoke a lot of today about the circuit framework where you break up uh, like a large uh, subgraph into these like individual components like attention heads and MLPs that are given to you by the architecture. You read what a transformer is and then you learn, okay, it has attention heads and MLPs. 
But both myself and current work, and I've heard of a number of other groups, are working on trying to go beyond these abstractions of just the heads in the model and the MLPs in the model to look for higher level motifs in models. So to be concrete, uh, like you can find as like I think in current work I've been working on that like certain uh, behaviors uh, such as suppressing these like negativity uh, heads in GPT two small generalized to the whole uh, distribution of training text uh, and you can find this motif that we call copy suppression in upcoming work that works across all the like training distribution rather than just on these narrow tasks. And it's also distributed across like several different heads rather than in like singular heads. And I know of a number of other groups who are also going beyond the sort of circuit paradigm where you explain uh, like different uh, model behaviors in terms of these uh, given components like attention heads and MLPs, but aggregates different components and weights them in clever ways to build like higher level motifs that like at this point in time, there are like very few examples of in the literature. And I expect that this is like the next big uh, phase of mechanistic interpretability research going beyond like narrow circuits and low level details to high level motifs about like how these large language models are doing computation. So yeah, I'd, I'd stay at, stay on the lookout for uh, higher level motifs that occur across different model components or like between different model components. That's uh, my personal um, current direction and what I'm excited to see other groups do work on. Cool. I love it. We will certainly keep an eye out for that. You've got the motifs notion. That's kind of a different sort of thing that you're looking for. Is there also a frontier on the automation of that or, or just better automation that you think will be a, a driver of a lot of value? Yeah, I think that the uh, automation to like find motifs or explain motifs is probably like quite a lot harder than the default path of uh, just narrow circuits. But I think that uh, there are a number of efforts which could be scaled up to either work with ACDC or would like go off on their own if they worked out particularly well to be able to like explain motifs. So the example would be the like open AI research where GPT-4 can be used to explain the neurons in GPT-2. And here, this is a useful complementary technique to like this automatic circuit discovery where we're like just finding structure because it's like by default assigning semantic meaning to different components. And I think that what using these like uh, language models in particular to try and explain what different components or even different subsets of different models are doing is a, like an approach which would be super exciting for uh, understanding how these uh, like motifs are present in different models that plausibly is somewhat more difficult uh, with just the pure circuit discovery approach. I love it. There's so much for us to continue to explore and learn about. And um, you've given us a great tour of uh, one corner of the world, but uh, we've got a lot more work to do. So Arthur Conway, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Thanks so much, Nathan. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. OmniKey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use CogRev to get a 10% discount. <laughs>